Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done about 550 of them now, and if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. This program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the website. My guest today is Chris Beal. I'll read a little bio she sent me. Chris discovered Buddhism as an exchange student in Japan in the 1960s. Given her determination, she was sure she would succeed in getting enlightened. But enthusiasm doesn't always guarantee success. She went home disappointed, depressed, and demoralized. Thirteen years later, after a spontaneous awakening, she contacted the Buddhist priest who had been her main teacher in Japan and began a six-year connection with, which deepened her understanding of what she had realized. Meanwhile, she sought a spiritual path in the States but found nothing that spoke to her as deeply as her first teacher had until she met Adyashanti 20 years ago. After almost a decade of absorbing his teachings, she found the realization gradually deepening on its own. Chris enjoys writing about spirituality and spiritual awakening. Her writing includes numerous published book reviews, author interviews, and articles. She is currently seeking publication of her novel, Enlightenment of the Flesh, in which the main character's dilemma reflects that of many seekers. How do you know which way will lead to the ultimate truth when what you are seeking is not in the realm of imagining. And she sent me a little passage from that book, kind of a teaser. I really enjoyed it and said, Chris, send me more. But she hasn't yet. <laughs> <laughs> She's a good writer. You're a good writer. I'd be happy to send you the whole 425 pages if you really want to read them. <laughs> well, unfortunately, now I'm, I'll be on to the next Person, but, I know. I knew you didn't have time. That's well, I, I had some time this week, but I, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it sounded very interesting. It was very. You, know, you never know. It, it was very well written. I, if you sent it to me, I might actually get back to it. My eyes are bigger than my stomach, as my mother used to say, with regard to things I'd like to read. Although she, she used that phrase with reference to food. Right. Um, let's start maybe just for kicks by. Um, having you elaborate a bit on this last sentence that I read. Um, how do you know which way will lead to the ultimate truth, capital T, when what you are seeking is not in the realm of imagining? What do you mean by that? Well, actually, I was thinking about that this morning, so I'm glad you asked me that question. Um, so the way the mind works, and I know you're an intellectual type, so you've probably thought a lot about these things. The way the mind works is that it takes experiences turns them into memories and with the memory it's it evaluates whether it should have more of those kinds of experiences or less of those kinds of experiences depending on whether it's painful or or you know uh enjoyable but enlightenment isn't like that or awakening isn't like that it isn't really an experience and, you know, when Aja used to say that, I'd like, what do you mean it isn't an experience? It felt like an experience to me, you know. But I understand now that what he means is that it's actually, it's a whole in experience, so to speak. I mean, a whole H-O-L-E? H-O-L-E, right. Yeah. Your, your consciousness, all of the thoughts just drop away. Everything drops away. And so my experience of it anyway is like it's you find out that your consciousness has an infinite bottom or doesn't have a bottom. So there's no, um, there's no referent really, cause it's not an experience. And so your mind can't take it and put it in memory. But what comes, what happens is when you come back from that experience, there's a kind of a, a flavor of it. That's very blissful. And because of that bliss, you want more of that thing that happened to you but it's not an experience. So there's a misunderstanding right away. I'm trying to have a, an experience like that again, but I can't because it's not an experience. So there's a, a dichotomy between what 
your mind usually does and it usually works for ordinary experiences and what it's trying to do now. And that can lead to all kinds of confusion and suffering and so on until that finally becomes clear that it's not something in the ordinary realm and you can't repeat it. You can have more awakenings, but every awakening is a dropping out of that, um, a dropping through the ordinary realm of thought into another, into what's bottomless, really. Yeah. yeah. There's a phrase, I think it's from the Brahma Sutras, which says, uh, contact with Brahman is infinite joy. And notice it says contact with Brahman. It doesn't say Brahman. It says contact with it. So like that, I was reminded of that when you just said, you know, when you come back from that, you may feel very blissful. But that in itself is not an experience. Um, and uh, if I understand what you're saying, um, you know, every, every other experience we have, by definition, uh, involves an experiencer, mechanics of experience, such as your eyes and ears, and an object of experience, you know, the thing you're perceiving. But the thing we're referring to here doesn't have that threefold structure, right? So it's, it's kind of not, it, it's very different from any other experience we could possibly have, and therefore a little bit hard, hard to define. Mm -hmm. Right. I think impossible to define, and that's also part of the problem, that people want to put words on it so they can understand it. And that's, you know, that's natural and even necessary to some extent. But when you haven't awakened, those words are literal. You try to take them literally, and that can also lead to a lot of confusion because it's, you know, it's, it's wordless, it's silence, and there are no words really. Yeah. And you try to compare it with something you have already experienced, which is what we naturally do. If, if someone exactly. says, you know, well, we try to describe what a mango tastes like. And they said, well, maybe it's a little bit like a peach. Have you ever had a peach? Yeah, I've had a peach, but it's, it's different than a peach. Maybe it's a little <laughs> bit more tangy than a peach or something. Yeah. And, you know, as if you mixed in some tangerine juice with peach. or so, and so you kind of beat around the bush, giving people an idea of what you're talking about. But then if they finally bite into the mango, they, oh, yeah, that's what you're talking about. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in any case, how do you know which way will lead to the ultimate truth when what you're seeking is not in the realm of imagining? Now, that's an interesting, I mean, we can pick this apart a little bit more because um, I, I know that, you know, from the time I learned to meditate back in the 60s, my concept of enlightenment or ultimate truth and all has, has evolved a lot. Um, I mean, I used to think, wow, if I were enlightened, I could be in a band and we could just get up on stage and compose <laughs> music spontaneously and we'd all be totally like psychically connected with each other and we could just do this great stuff without it re even rehearsing. And <laughs> I had all these ideas about <laughs> what it might mean. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, you know, you naturally mature and grow in your understanding and your experience. Um, but I still think there's a, you know, it's, it's a word I hesitate to use, enlightenment, because there's such a wide range of definitions of it. And if you want to communicate with people, you actually want them to understand what you're saying. And so we try not to use words that are going to be misinterpreted. Right. And the mind really can't understand it anyway. So it's going to refer back to experiences like that. Like for you, it was playing in the band with, you know, total, total without rehearsing, just knowing what to play. And for someone else, it's something else that is as close as they can get to ultimate joy, you know. Mm. That, that brings up another interesting question. And, and that is that I have a friend who's been on BatGap a couple of times. Dan, Dana Sawyer is his name. And, um, He's been a professor of religions at, uh, at a university in Maine, and he wrote a biography of Aldous Huxley and um, another one of Houston Smith and was actually friends with Houston Smith. And he and I have had this discussion about, you know, whether there is some ultimate truth which people around the world throughout the ages uh, all can tap into and they're all experiencing the same thing, or whether, you know, the the whether what people tap into in quote unquote higher states of consciousness, however the culture at, in question defines it, is unique to that culture and that time and that person. And, you know, that if people, if all these people who say they have been enlightened or have gotten enlightened could actually step inside each other's 
shoes, so to speak, and see it from the other's perspective, they wouldn't necessarily say, oh, yeah, that's what I was experiencing. There might actually be significant differences. What do you think about that? Um, well, it, what it reminds me of is Jung's collective unconscious. And I think that's, that is the realm where there's culture or, um, you know, you go into a space where you have a collective culture. I think awakening is a step beyond that. So um, you're not talking about archetypes anymore. Um, as I said, the, the basis of it is nothing. So um, only when we get to the place of where there's nothing, then we have true unity because there are no, there's nothing else. There's no reference, you know. Um, I guess I don't have anything else to say about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, I, actually, I agree with you, and that's kind of what I argue with Dana, which is that I, I think that w the way I would prefer to in divine enlightenment is, is that it's a sort of a, a waking up to uh, the ultimate reality. I you think you use the term ultimate reality somewhere in here, the truth, capital T, ultimate truth, and that the human nervous system is actually capable, unlike perhaps any other sort of nervous system we know of, of enabling the truth to awaken to itself. Maybe that's a good way of putting it, because it's not like you get enlightened, mm -hmm. but somehow right. or other it becomes a living experience through the instrument of the human nervous system, properly cultured. And, um, and if that is the case, uh, then there would be a similarity, despite the culture or the age in which one lived. I mean, yeah, it would be identical in one sense, but one would just reflect it differently according to their language and personality and all. Yeah, that's that's I was what I was going to add yeah. that you added. Yeah, I think um, it's gone. Whatever I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It'll come back. Feel free to interrupt me if if I'm talking along and you think of something you want to say because I don't want you to lose your train of thought. Um, let's turn to your sort of biographical sketch i mean you know what you've been through in your life and and we can sort of take little detours as we go as you describe that to us and explore different ideas but um what what drew you to go to japan in the first place in the 1960s uh, it, it was actually not a very deep decision um i had there was an, a woman in my dorm who had gone to france I didn't think I could pass the language test, and there wasn't a language test for Japan because it was the first year of the program. Partly because it was the first year of the program, and partly because, you know, in those days and maybe still, people only studied Asian languages if they were that major, if they were a Japanese major or something like that. And they wanted people from a wider background, you know, to apply for the program. So there was no language requirement. And I thought, oh, I'll probably get to Europe anyway someday but japan when would i get there you yeah. know in those days japan was a lot farther away you know yeah. psychologically than it is now you know cool do you know shins and young or know who he is no i've never heard that name yeah i've interviewed him a couple times young? Uh, young like neil young said just y-o-u-n-g oh. but shins and s-h-i-n-z-e-n i've interviewed him a couple times and he also grew up in los angeles and he ended up going to some kind of Japanese American high school there and spoke fluent Japanese even before he went to Japan. But you might enjoy checking into his yeah, story. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, I will. He did yeah. all kinds of really intense Zen practice over there in Japan, you know, just get chewed by mosquitoes and just, you know, just you know, <laughs> persevering. And <laughs> Interesting story. Yeah, so that, that, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but that does Anything, bring yeah. up for me... Um, one of the themes of the novel, you know, how much do you have to suffer uh. in order to get enlightened or whatever? Um, you know, and certainly the belief when I was young and um, my character Jeannie's belief when she was young, she somewhat reflects me, is that you have to suffer or it's not going to happen. And, you know, I mean, that's karmic stuff. You believe everything that's worthwhile. You really have to work for it. And if it's too easy, it's not real. And, um, you know, so I think that's that's a worthwhile discussion, you know. Yeah. To well, what extent? Since it came up, it let's be... talk about it now. And then, like I say, we'll take little detours and we'll just keep coming back. Okay. 
Um, well, can it be too easy? You know, you, you see these, I remember when I was looking for a teacher kind of casually, I found uh, Adya on a bulletin board. There was a flyer saying that songs. And I, I studied the flyer and I thought, he seems genuine, you know, and I don't know what it was, but I think that he wasn't claiming too much. Yeah. You know, it was that, um, you know, I'd, I'll just come and see what it's like. It's not, I am the big teacher. <laughs> I, I, I there wasn't like a bunch of gold around his head. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and so I think there's also a tendency for people of maybe the opposite pers- personality type to go for what's easy. You know, the easy promise, the easy, you know, I have all the answers, come to me and I'll give you the answer. And then you get involved in a cult or something like that. Yeah. And uh, so it's just an interesting, um, it's an interesting question, which I try to explore in the book. You know, what is it that, what's the real way or is there one way or are there multiple ways for different people and how can you be misled? What causes people to be misled by a teacher who's promising to help you wake up? Mm. And I think this is not part of the novel, but I think one of the one of the signposts of a genuine teacher is if they know how to turn you away, if they know how not to give you answers and turn you back on yourself. And not only at the end, but during the process. And I think Aja is very good at that. He knows how to say just enough without, you know, because if, if you're looking to the teacher for all the answers, you're never going to find it inside. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Those are all interesting questions, which I think about a lot myself um, on the question. And we'll unpack that. But on the question of suffering, obviously the Buddha went through a lot of suffering, right? Before his enlightenment and the reason he got enlightened finally was that he decided to like cut himself some slack. You know, he just decided to ease up a bit. He, and kind of then he taught the middle way after that, which right. you know, which is not you're not a lazy slob, but you're also not you know killing yourself trying to <laughs> trying to get enlightened. You right. you found a sort of a balance. Yeah, and I think there's two kinds of suffering. One is the kind that is karmic that you have to undergo anyway because it's just you're who you are. You were born in this circumstance that you were born in. And then the other kind is the kind that you decide you need to impose on yourself in order that that, that comes from the will that you need to, you need to do this in order to earn it, so to speak, you know? Yeah. Um, And I don't remember if I had another thought after that. That's okay. Um, We'll go back back and forth, but um, yeah, now suffering. So obviously there are different kinds of suffering. There's sitting in a zendo being chewed by mosquitoes and it's freezing cold and you're tired and you know every, and you know somebody comes along and whacks you with a stick every now and then it's it's not everyone's idea of a picnic um and then obviously so that's a sort of a self-imposed austerity or discipline and obviously then there are all kinds of diseases and other circumstances in life that can cause great suffering maybe, maybe this is what you meant by you know there are certain karmas that people have that are inescapable it seems and others that we might take upon ourselves willingly. Mm-hmm. Right, right. One interesting question, though, is we mentioned bliss earlier, and you mentioned how one can s- slip into the transcendent or whatever word you used, and and maybe you don't experience much while you're there because it's not really a, an, an experience per se, but afterwards you feel all this blissfulness. Um, mm-hmm. And one way of looking at it is that... Um, that innermost nature is blissful by its nature. All the traditions say that the kingdom of heaven is within and nirvana is supposed to be blissful. And, you know, the samadhi, different terminologies, satchitananda, ananda means bliss. Um, So if it's blissful, um, shouldn't there be a a diminishment of suffering as one moves toward it? Shouldn't there be sort of greater happiness or greater charm and less suffering? What do you mean by moved toward it? Do you mean before the first awakening or after the first awakening? As awakenings are deepening. Or as, yeah, awakenings are deepening. Or as one progresses toward it. Like, you know, let's say you sit down to meditate and your awareness starts to settle in and settle down. Perhaps, I mean, perhaps one would find that if it's done naturally, 
perhaps one would find that to be increasingly charming um, and uh, enjoyable, actually. Whereas there are some kinds of practice that one does where one is kind of from the outset setting up a struggle you know, oh, thoughts come, got to stop that, mm-hmm. um, you know, and so that can be very un- unpleasant. Um, so th- th- it has to do with kind of the mechanics of meditation, I think. They, meditation is like the word enlightenment. Come, it, it's defined very differently by different people. Um, it's like the word liquid. I mean, there's so many things that are, uh, that are liquids, but they're very different in their properties. Uh-huh. Well, I'm not a meditator. And I, I think Zen cured me of meditation forever. Well, that's interesting, yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> so you know, one of the attractions of Aja for me was that I believed him when he said, you don't have to do anything. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I can just feel it now as I'm saying it, you know, that I believed him. And that's what I needed was to believe him. You don't have to do anything. It's already your true nature. Mm. And so there is a... Um, when you say, is it already blissful as you're moving toward it? Not in my experience, but I wasn't meditating. Um, I think as after you have the first awakening, everything relaxes. Yeah, yeah. You know, the way I, I experienced it and um, is that you always feel like you're too small for the container that you're in. Mm. And once you have the awakening, it's just blows up and you're like, you realize you're as big as you've always wanted to be, and not in a grandiose way, but in the real way, in the genuine way. Nice. So I get the you kind of I get the impression that when you were in Japan, you were trying to meditate a lot, and like you say, that cured you of the desire to meditate, um, and that you came home disappointed, depressed, demoralized. So it sounds like it was kind of a struggle, and that it wasn't terribly fruitful. Uh, is that right? It wasn't fruitful at all, although some seeds were planted. Some seeds were planted. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, I, how did you even glom onto the idea that there was such a thing of enlightenment? Because you didn't go to Japan with that thought in mind. You must have discovered it over there. Uh, no, I actually discovered it on the ship on the way over. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. You had a book or something? <laughs> well, I didn't know. I, that's, that's actually not true. Uh, there was a book called, uh, it was written by... A Southern Californian, I can't remember the name of the book now, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, he wrote about uh, the beatnik culture in Los Angeles. And I read that book maybe a summer or two before I went to Japan. And that was run, and they were all doing Zen. And that was the first I heard about Zen. So I did know about it. Um, but when I was on the ship on the way over, I met someone who was going there. To do Zen. Um, he was from one of the Ivy League schools. I, he just graduated. I can't remember the one now. And uh, so, you know, I, I was reading uh, Suzuki's, uh, Daisetsu Suzuki, not the one in San Francisco, um, Zen Buddhism. And it was on our list of readings for, you know, enculturating us for, for Japan, you know. And uh, so he started talking to me. And uh, I said, okay, if I ever want to contact you so I can, you know, visit your Zen center or something, is there a way I can do it? And he gave me his contact information. And so after I'd been in Japan a short time, I contacted him. He was in Kyoto. I was in Tokyo. But um, I went over there and uh, I talked to his teacher, whose name I don't remember. He's not alive anymore, of course. And uh, he gave me contact information to go for in Tokyo. And I followed up that information and uh, ended up doing Zen at Enkakuji, which was Daisetsu Suzuki's temple. He was actually there. Hmm. So Cool. And then, you know, he came home demoralized and all that. But then 13 years later, um, you had a spontaneous awakening. Was that actually, that was still pre-Adya, I would assume. Oh, way before Adya. Way before Adya. Yeah. So way how, before what did, what, how did this spontaneous awakening happen and what was it? Um. Let's see if I can say it in a simple way. So I was longing for somebody. I had a crush on somebody who wasn't returning my (laughs) affections. And I kept hoping. And this was the realization, oh, no interest there. And so I remember I was lying on my bed and feeling, oh, oh. And there was, for me, 
I don't know if it's for everybody, but with rejection, there was also a kind of self-blame, like maybe I shouldn't be wanting this and that's why I'm suffering, you know, and somehow that just went and it was okay to have every feeling that I had. I didn't have to push it away. And then I kind of went through into something else where it's okay, whatever my body is doing and feeling, and by body, I meant mind, body, everything, you know, uh, it's okay. And that was the, it was just a little hint. And, but that it was enough to know what that space was like. And then I wrote to my teacher thinking I couldn't, you know, I had no relationship with him, but I had no one else to tell. <laughs> so but <laughs> but I thought, <laughs> even though, though there was this little hint, it was significant enough that you counted as an awakening. Yeah, he counted it as an awakening. He wrote back and said, you've entered nirvana and da, 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 da. And I'm like, oh, I thought this was just a little hint. So I think it was deeper than I was able to recognize at that time, you know, the, the sense of, the sense, I think a big piece of moving into the awake space is stopping the inner struggle. And that struggle stopped for a moment and I fell into that space, but I didn't recognize it because I'd never been there before. I had no referent, you know? Yeah. And I had no teacher to tell me. Yeah. yeah I think that I agree that that's a big piece. And, um, you know, you remember Audrey's story, certainly of how he was like, you know, struggling like a son of a gun and, you know, just like really pushing himself to the limits. And, you know, he got to the point where he thought he was going to crack up because he was pushing so hard with his meditation and his retreats that he was doing and everything. And finally, he just went back to his little meditation hut in the backyard of his parents' home and sat down and thought, ah, to heck with it. I give up. I can't struggle like this anymore. <laughs> and then poof, you know, had this yeah. major awakening. <laughs> right. That was after he'd left that retreat, right? He yeah, left yeah. That I think he, yeah, he like right. split in the middle of it because he just had reached his limit. Right. <laughs> Well, I think that's interesting. I think it's also interesting just to throw in here that I don't think one has to beat oneself over the head with a hammer to see how good it'll feel when you stop, um, to use that metaphor. I think one can can approach spiritual development in a non-struggling way from the outset, but that's kind of another story. Um, yeah, that, well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, yeah. You can, I, I think, again, that that's karmic. I think there are some people who really feel the need to push themselves. They don't feel it's real if they're not struggling. They don't feel like they're really going to get somewhere. And there are other people who have had maybe a more gentle upbringing and don't necessarily think that you have to, you know, go through suffering in order to get there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There's another phrase from the Vedas that says, be easy to us with gentle effort. Um, and mm. in my own case, I happened upon a teaching that was explicitly um, discouraged any, any form of struggling. It was emphasized in terms of being effortless and natural and all that stuff. So I never went through a struggling phase. But uh. and I imagine that people who get together with Adya and, at any time in his teaching were never encouraged to struggle by him. Um, his approach is, we've had discussions about this, but it seems very natural and, and effortless. Um, you know, he, he's not trying to um, amplify any kind of inner turmoil that people might be habituated to. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, once I had had that first awakening and um, then there was a subsequent one that was a lot deeper um, that m my teacher in Japan precipitated from 5,000 miles away <laughs> miraculously. <laughs> Was that um, shortly after the first one? Or yeah, too, it was shortly yeah. after the well, first one. Two, keep going here, but describe, at some point, describe that one too. Um, I can. Um, so after I connected with him, and this is actually an important theme, I think, so I might as well talk about it now. Um, one of, the, one of my, the things that I have done repeatedly in my journey is project that... Um, project that perfection onto the teacher. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as he wrote back, there was just this huge attachment. Oh, he gets me. He knows what it's like, you know, and 
Um, and I became really dependent on him. Every letter he wrote and writing, you know, communicating in those days, he didn't speak English and I didn't write Japanese well enough to write in Japanese. So the you letters had, to have had things to be translated, translated in both directions. Uh. And it took, you know, and then you had the mail. It took like, uh, I guess it's, uh, three weeks is about as quick as I could get a response. So I was just hanging on every word, you know, when is the next response going to come? Will he still accept me? You know, and so I finally got a letter and I wish I had it here because I don't have a good memory of what it said right now. But he was essentially saying, I don't have anything for you. And it just, I just like, oh, it's gone. And everything was gone. Everything was gone. I couldn't. I, how could I function without him? I had become by that time so dependent on him. I felt my whole life was him and he was gone. And um, and then I don't, gosh, I wish it would come. Maybe by the time we're finished talking, it'll come clearer because I forget it right now. But something happened where there was just, I, I, he, oh, he said in the letter, you got to stop looking for love out there. You know, and I said, well, I said to myself, well, I would if I could, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know how. And then just something kind of, there was just this little turn of my mind, and there it was. It was just asking the question, and there it was, that thing that I'd been looking for, how to find love inside. Hmm. And, um, and it was just, it was so deep. That one, I mean, that was no question that there was an awakening there. You know, it was like, yeah. So that was the second one. Yeah, you know, that song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. right. But, you know, it didn't st- I didn't stop doing it, interestingly. Um, there was still that projection on the teachers for a long time. By the time I met Adya, it was much, much less because I had been through so much by that time. but um, And because of that, my relationship with Aji was relatively painless. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Well, I've definitely been there myself, so I can totally relate to it. Um, and I think it's natural at a certain stage. There's so many different stages of growth that people can go through, mm-hmm. e- even in ordinary life, you know? I mean, there's a certain stage at which you're totally dependent on your parents, and you see your parents as, like, invincible or you know yeah. all, all knowing or something like that and um then you get perhaps disillusioned with that and you go through your teenage years and you start getting rebellious and distancing yourself from your parents and then later on you begin to feel like well they, they weren't so bad after all you know <laughs> they're, they're doing a pretty good job they're doing the best they could and we go through all these phases and you know you can go through that with spiritual teachers too yeah and i don't think it's wrong i think the projection is natural yeah but that's why it's so important to have the right teacher because the wrong teacher will encourage that and the right teacher will turn you back on yourself. You're very good. Yeah, you said that earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, it becomes this sort of negative feedback loop with the wrong teacher where their ego gets amplified and then, you know, you get more dependent on them and there's more and more of an emphasis is I'm the one who's doing this for you and I'm the one who's creating the Shakti here or whatever. Um, and then, you know, I don't know, it just becomes like a, self-reinforcing sort of situation that can get very unhealthy. I mean, you, we've seen how far off the rails some of these situations can get. But, you know, it's, it's, it's good to sort of not throw the baby out with the bathwater and to kind of keep a, a balanced perspective. I mean, there's so many people, there are many people who sort of, they go through something like that and then they say, that's it, no more teachers. Teachers are no good. Nobody should have a teacher. You know, they kind mm-hmm. of go to that extreme. That's one of the dangers of having a bad teacher. They you get disillusioned. You, once you, yeah, you get disillusioned and maybe turn away from the whole spiritual project altogether. Yeah, mm-hmm. which I think is probably not good karma for the teacher who who causes that to happen. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I don't mean to talk too much here, but so you always interrupt me if if a thought comes to mind. But we're just kind of going back and forth. But yeah, I, I, the, what does come to mind now is the value of culturing discernment. Um, in fact, um, Mariana Kaplan wrote a couple of books along this, these lines. One was called Eyes Wide Open, Cultivating Discernment on the, the Spiritual Path. And another was um, Do You Need a Guru? 
and it, it analyzed the whole question in great depth. And her conclusion was, yeah, basically you do, at least at some point. Um, uh-huh. And then she wrote another one called Halfway Up the Mountain, The Error of Premature Claims to Awakening. Oh, that's an interesting, I, I don't know her. I'll have to take a look at her books. Yeah, the title yeah. alone. She's been on Bath Gap a couple of times. The title alone yeah, gives you a, a real you know, pithy <laughs> summary of what that book's about. Uh-huh, right. Well, there is, uh, you know, you don't know what you don't know when you don't know it. Exactly. And so it's it's natural that after people have had an awakening, they feel like this is the end all and be all of everything, you know. Did you ever get it to a point like that? Did you ever feel that way? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I never felt that I wanted to teach when I wasn't ready. I think, and I don't even know if I'm ready now, you know. Um, I think there's a certain naturalness that happens when, um, when you come to a place where it comes to rest in you and there's no more struggle. On the other hand, I mean, it, it also can be said that so far as an awakening goes for people that haven't had one, anybody can be, anyone who's had one can be a teacher in a way, you know, as long as they don't get attached to that idea that they're the teacher, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, somebody who's in first grade can teach his little sister ABC, you know? Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) I think, I think that one thing that happens, and I mean, I just talked about this, even though he had had multiple awakings when he started to teach, but, um, one thing that happens with the first awakening or the second or the third is you think that's the way. And I look at teachers who have a that's the way attitude, and you've interviewed some of them, although I'm not going to name them, um, <laughs> um, as people who haven't really had the full panoply of awakening because awakening experiences. Because once you begin to see all the different ways it can manifest, there isn't any just one way. People wake up a myriad of ways, and everybody's totally different. So there has to be a, there has to be a way to recognize underneath the multiplicity of experiences what is the genuine awakening. You know? Also, I've said this so many times that people have been telling me I shouldn't say it so often, but <clears throat> you know, I kind of feel like I've kind of come to the conclusion that there probably is no final awakening. Um, saying I'm mm-hmm. I'm totally awakened would be like saying I'm totally educated. You know, couldn't, yeah, couldn't, yeah. Couldn't possibly learn another thing. <laughs> I agree with that. I, I I don't know. I may you know I may change my mind in the future, but um, I think there's a certain basic realization that you want to have had, and maybe enough. You might be familiar enough with that territory that you know what it looks like. You haven't just had a few glimpses. Right, right. (laughs) But in the end, it can always be deeper. You can always go, you can always say, oh, I never saw that before, you know? Yeah. And According to Kundalini Vidya, uh, I interviewed a woman named Joan Harrigan. It's on bat. Yep. There's, you know... in terms of that understanding, there once the kundalini reaches what they call the makara point here or makara, um, it doesn't go down again. It won't go down again. So that's stabilized. It's not all the way up. And, you know, there's more. Re- and even when it is all the way up, there's plenty of refinement that can continue to take mm. place as long as you live. But mm. according to that tradition, there is a point at which you're beyond the possibility of slipping back. Oh, that's interesting. It it brings up, you know, at the time that I was involved with my first teacher, I was having a lot of Kundalini experience. Um, Just this whole, mostly it happened in dreams. I'd wake up from a dream and have all these streamings going all through my body. It was really fascinating. Energy flows, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, that whole body of understanding is that we have this vast network of subtle um, energy conduits, nadis, they call them, throughout the body. And they all have to be purified in order for awakening to be fully embodied. 
that's interesting. I, I I don't know if that's true. I don't know that much about it. Yeah. Uh, it's it's. I guess for me, and this is probably a personality thing, but I I react to this. Uh, <laughs> I react to the word purified. <laughs> mm. I have a negative, you know, sort of idea that. To me, and again, this is probably just a personality thing. I don't want to state state it as any ultimate truth or anything, but. For me, it seems as though um, the path is more about everything being okay, you know. So it's not about getting rid of certain things, or it's. And I don't know whether everything being okay is has anything to do with awakening o- itself, but it opens the door because the struggle, the psychic energy that's involved in the struggle to get rid of certain things yeah um keeps you shackled somehow psychologically shackled somehow so when that relaxes like like it did with that very first awakening where i was like it's okay it's okay love is okay it doesn't i don't have to get rid of love just because i didn't get it back in one on one occasion you know <laughs> it's okay everything i'm feeling is okay and so I tend to go more in that direction. Um, I know you've interviewed Pamela Wilson um, because actually that's how I discovered Bat Gap. I was in a satsang with her and somebody said, made reference to her Bat Gap interview. And I said, Bat Gap, what's that? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and afterward he told me what it was. Um, but she is so, you know, that op- just open arms. Mm-hmm. Everything comes in. Everything comes in, and I, when I discovered her, that was my, you know, it was the next place I had to go, mm. you know, that feminine energy. Yeah. I think I discovered her in two thousand eight, something like mm-hmm. that. You know, that was a, even after you'd been involved with Audrey for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was quite a bit after, mm-hmm. and 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 you know, and I I felt that I there was that little bit of sort of feminine inclusive energy that i needed you know that yeah. was um yeah so yeah you know well, it's it's like we all need different things at different times and mm-hmm. um, i kind of think of it like you know if you fly from here to uh let's say someplace in let's say Kathmandu, um you you're not going to do it in one plane flight um, there's no plane flight that goes directly from Iowa to Kathmandu. First, you're going to fly to Chicago and then probably New <laughs> Delhi and then New Delhi to Kathmandu. And you wouldn't say that one of those flights is better or more important than the others. Each one is necessary and is an important, you know, leg of, of the overall journey. So, yeah, um, yeah. you know, obviously there, some people stick with one teacher for their whole lives. Other people just move you know, other people are totally um, you know, dilettantes and, and they just jump around too much without going deep. But others, I think, take, right. you know, go s- seriously, uh, enjoy or derive benefit from what a teacher has to offer. But at a certain point, maybe a different teacher has to offer something they need. Yeah, uh, well, for me, it was also a practical thing because I came into the Sangha just as, I just Sangha, just as it was really growing mm-hmm. very, very fast. Right. And at the very beginning, the first couple of years, I was able to have one, one-on-one talks with him, but mm-hmm. then he just cut it off. There were too many people. He yeah. couldn't see them all. And I felt I needed that. I right. needed that. And I found Dorothy Hunt, who was in mm-hmm. the Sangha. I actually found her when she was still a student. You know, I, she was not a, she was not a teacher then, but she was sitting in the front row, and I saw her, and I thought, her, <laughs> you know, and and I went up to her at lunchtime. I never did that. I always wanted the silence at lunchtime. I never wanted to talk to anybody, but I went up to her and I said, "Will you have lunch with me?" And she said, "Well, I'm manning this table, but if you want to keep me company, I, that'd be nice." And so, so I did, and I told her the story about my first teacher who had. There's a long story behind that, but I lost him. And I was still going through this ache that I had lost my first teacher. And so I, I was just telling her the story of my spiritual journey. And that, then the next, that night, it was an intensive, so it was all day Saturday and Sunday afternoon. Um, that night I thought, I'm going to ask Aja about this ache I still have about losing my first teacher. 
And so I did. And I asked him, I said, you know, I'm just tired of giving it to him. All that love is going over to him. I'm tired of it. And I'd already been through that, the first awakening. You know, so you see that the pattern didn't stop at that point. And, and he said, so I said, I want to get it back. I want, it, I want to recognize it here. And he said, well, it could be over there or it could be here. But really, it's just love. And that was it. Just my mind just split open. And that was the first awakening with Aja. So she not only, you know, she, she, she was important to me because she precipitated that by just listening to my story and taking it in, you know. And, um, yeah, she was one of the important people to me because I was able to see her one-on-one. Yeah, that's good. Let's, uh, well, let me ask somebody's question here. A question came in. Um, this is for, and then we'll get back to more stuff. This is from a guy named Prakash in uh, Redmond, Washington. Um, and it touches upon some of the things we've already talked about and others we haven't. He said, well, the first part of his question is, can any stage of consciousness be forced? So I'm not sure what he means by any stage of consciousness. I think because... he's implying, well, here's the second part that elaborates a bit. He said, seeking that arises in an individual is a natural process, and the stages of consciousness achieved are also natural. So many people feel that there are progressive stages of unfoldment of higher consciousness, right? And mm-hmm. some of them have been, you know, given na- some traditions have given them specific names. Um, and if you read the Yoga Sutras, for instance, there's all these degrees of samadhi and so on. Um, so I, I guess he's asking, can you, um, can you kind of storm the, the gates of heaven, as it were, and, and uh, force yourself into a higher state or a more awakened state or some such thing? And well, here's let, let me read this whole question because he he goes on. Um, he said, "I experienced a level of consciousness when I had some trauma. When the trauma stopped, the experience of consciousness and love exists in my memory uh, and continues as a meditation practice. Advancement in my level of consciousness is not in my hands. So I guess he feels it's not force; it's not in his hands. Um, and uh, I guess he's saying, you know, could he have?" willfully made this progress um, earlier or on his own or whatever? Or was it really just sort of a matter of circumstances that triggered the progression that he has experienced? I don't know if you can answer this, but it's, you, know, you might have an opinion about it based on your own experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I do, but I'm not sure I'm right. Um, I, I think... Um, and for me, it's always been about finding the right setting. So I know there are some people, and he seems to have been one of them, that just woke up. And I did have a spontaneous awakening. So that's a little bit, what I said, I just have to eat my words a little bit here. But um, I think when you're in the right setting, and especially when you have the right teacher, it does happen naturally. You can't force it beyond that, you know. But if you're just out in the world and you're surrounded by people who are, you know, not awake, um, it's pretty hard. Yeah. You know, there, you don't have a, you don't have any uh, reminders that there is a deeper place, you know. And so I don't think, you know, I'm not very familiar with the uh, the yoga, the different types of yoga and right, the different philosophies stuff. around them and all of that. But it seems to me that um, the deeper thing that drives you, most people that I've talked to say they had it from the time they were children. And they didn't know, in my case, I, I didn't know about it, you know, but there's always some kind of, this isn't enough. This isn't enough. There's some kind of lack. Mm. And that lack drives the forward thrust to awakening and then to to deeper experiences. Um, I think from what he talks about, he's had I and I'm not there. And I didn't experience it with him, so I don't know exactly. But it sounds like it's a hint of where he needs to go. And if he doesn't put, you know, impediments in his way, he'll go there. You know, he's had an opening already. 
So he knows that place exists. And in that sense, yeah, I think once you've had an opening, there is a kind of a, a driving force to move you in that direction because it's so blissful. It's so blissful. <laughs> There's that you word know? again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a very yeah. helpful answer. I think um, his final comment was when you're ready, books, teachers, and experiences find you, you know, the old saying, when the student is ready, the teacher mm-hmm. appears. Um, and what you said in there about, um, you know, putting yourself in con- circumstances conducive to an awakening is an important thing. Um, a lot, a lot of the traditions say it's if you're interested in enlightenment or whatever words they use, it's really important to hang around the right people. Um, you know, ha- <laughs> hang around kindred souls who are also interested yeah. in it. If you hang around people who couldn't give a darn and, and are are kind of going on a different direction, I mean, when I first learned to meditate, I basically dropped all my friends and just um, didn't have friends for a few months until I began to accumulate new friends, because my oh, friends okay. were getting into heroin and doing stuff that wasn't conducive to what I wanted to now do with my life. I'm glad you did that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you might not be sitting here right now. <laughs> I might not. I came close to not. Um, but it's there is definitely something to, I, I think Jesus has said things like that. It's in the Vedic traditions that, um, you know, being around spiritual aspirants is conducive to spiritual development. And, uh, you know, obviously that doesn't mean that we shouldn't visit our family or, you know, be, or sh- just sort of be holier than thou or around people or anything. But, um, you know, going on spiritual retreats, having friends that we can discuss these things with and so on, mm. reading the appropriate types of websites or whatever, p- putting right. your attention on it. I mean, I do this all week long. I'm always putting my attention on this stuff because yeah. I love it. Mm-hmm. And, and talking exactly. to people like you, you know, because I love doing it. Right. And I feel like it's a powerful evolutionary influence. It is. I agree with you. My next question is just a wrap up of something. I, I mentioned purification of the knot, and you said, I, I don't like have this association. I, purification. <laughs> I have association with the with the word purification, and it does have sort of um, you know moralistic implications, or you know you know all kinds of puritanical <laughs> connotations and so on. So I don't mean it in that sense. I, I mean it more of a in a neurophysiological mm-hmm. sense. Um, and you know it's it's said that we have all these deep impressions in in our makeup in our neurophysiological makeup and that um those impressions they condition us and even in western psychology this is understood you know one can become deeply conditioned into certain habit patterns and behaviors and so on and so you know part of the whole knowledge of this is that the neurophysiology can be transformed and that transformation could be understood with a word like purification, just basically would mean restructuring the chemical and structural makeup of the system and eliminating, you know, abnormalities in that in that realm. Which obstructions might be a obstructions. Good word. That's a good word. Yeah. Yes, um, because they're you know. The, the body could be thought of as an instrument through which we live whatever we do, we experience, you know, we experience anything, surfing or watching a movie or eating a meal, we're using the, the, this instrument. And so certainly a, 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 an experience, I don't mean to say experience because we've already talked about how inadequate that word is, but let's, for the sake of convenience, an experience as profound as enlightenment um, must require a profoundly different state of neurophysiological functioning than ordinary waking state? I think I have a lot of, you had so many things in there, I don't even know where to start. Um, I think, first of all, that um, there is certainly a necessity for the body not to be holding patterns that keep the I guess the thoughts or the karmic um, the karmic energy in place, so there isn't room. There isn't room to fall through to that groundless place. So, in a sense, and I, I don't really know very much about it. I I was doing uh, a kind of body work at the time I had the original opening, and I still think it was Reikian work, and I still think that it played a role. It it opened up places where I had been holding and allowed that to happen. Um, One of the things that you brought up is something that I've been 
moving more and more toward, I guess I could say, is that the body isn't just a vehicle, but the body is it. The body is the awakeness itself. It manifests. It's the awakeness manifests as the body. And um, this was when I, my most recently acquired teacher, although he doesn't know he's my teacher, is Rupert Spira. Oh, Rupert, yeah, he's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I've listened to both of your interviews with him. Mm -hmm. um, but my interest in him is because he focuses that, he focuses that so clearly, you know, that um, it's not just a vehicle, but it is. And as long as you think of it as just a vehicle, you've got a subtle duality going on. You've got, you know, the awakening, which is somehow insubstantial. Mm -hmm. And you've got the body that's substantial. And one of the things that I realized is there is no substantiality. Everything is empty. Yeah. And I remember exactly where I was when I had that realization. And mm -hmm. so... I remember taking it to Adya and saying, how can this be? <laughs> and how can this be? <laughs> it was so such a miracle. And I remembered, you know, I used to chant in Zen, we used to chant, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, form is nothing but emptiness, emptiness is nothing but form. Mm. And I suddenly understood what that meant. You know, it was like, <laughs> there's nothing substantial. And that's why when I touch something, it feels like I'm touching myself. Mm. Not always, but when I'm focused on it. When I mean, not not when I'm making my lunch, but when I'm, you know, when I'm. I remember the times in the very beginning when I I keep touching a table, or I would touch Harry's dashboard. He remembers this, I'm sure. He's nodding. I would keep touching his dashboard, and I found out his dashboard. I say, what is that? Because at first I didn't know. I couldn't figure it out how it felt funny. And Ajay helped me a lot with this because he got it. He got even though I didn't have the words for it, he got he got what I was experiencing, that that lack of separation. He got it and yet he didn't say too much. Because if he said too much, it would have gone into the mind, you know. He let me discover it experientially, what it means when you touch something and it's not other anymore, you know. And so this body, I think, is already awake, but it's not substance the way we usually think of the body. You know, it's it's something else that I can't define, you know. That's very interesting. And not only is this body that that substance that we can't define, but Harry's dashboard or the sidewalk or the exactly. tree the tree or everything else. I mean, if That's we, right. you know, people use the word non-duality. Okay, well, if non-duality is really the reality, then there, then everything is really just one thing. Although it's not a thing; it's a thingless thing. Uh, just it's a thingless thing, exactly. You know, one sort <laughs> like of that. substanceless substance, as it were. Um, and you know, Rupert speaks of that eloquently in terms of consciousness. Everything is consciousness. Um, and it may be consciousness appearing as a computer monitor or as appearing as your body or appearing as a pile of dog poop or whatever, but it, it's all one thing. And, of course, physicists, you know, chime in here, some of the more enlightened physicists, and, and corroborate that with their understanding that if you get right down to the real nitty-gritty, there is no diversity. Um, it's just, diversity is an appearance um, in unity. Yeah, there's no diversity in, I mean, in substance, but there, yeah. there is diversity in, I mean, that was, I don't know, you only read the first chapter where, I don't know if you Dean is asking me that the question in my novel, but <laughs> I'll send them to you, I really will. <laughs> but she asked that question, she's, she's asked that question by some of her, um, the students in her, at her college, she's asked, you know, what do you mean by sameness? I wouldn't want everything to be the same. And she realized she's really confused about this. She doesn't know whether everybody everything becomes identical or what but yeah. you're right it's exactly the way you said it's the appearance is everything is diverse but there's a fundamental suchness yeah and that suchness is identical for everything and there's always a paradoxical thing where yeah it's the, it's all the same but it's not um i used the this analogy last week but uh, i'll use it again because it's 
germane here, but the, in Vedanta, there's a term called mithya, M-I-T-H-Y-A, and it means dependent reality. And they use mm. an example of clay pots where you might have a whole shop full of clay pots for sale. And you go in there and you see the, the big pots, little pots, red pots, brown pots, whatever. Um, and there seems to be a great deal of diversity in the, in the shop. But if you get right down to it, there's actually nothing but clay. You know, you could, mm-hmm. you could, right. you could truthfully say there are no pots here. It's only clay. And you, you wouldn't right. be wrong. It's just like you wouldn't have the full picture because at the very same time, there are pots. And it's absurd right. to deny that there are. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I'm familiar with that analogy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Irene, but, but there's oh, this, go ahead. I'm con- continue. There is something that, you know, there's a way of, I'm, I'm starting to see it now. Can you see it? Can you feel what we're, what we're experiencing right now? Sure. Yeah. So um, there's a way that you can connect in an energetic way and feel that that field where there isn't a diversity, where there's something underneath that. Yeah. Reminds me of that Rumi quote. Remember, the, there's a field beyond right and wrong. Uh, I'll meet you there, yeah. that, that nice little quote. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I love Rumi. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, the field isn't just in some transcendental realm. The field is all-pervading. Yes. And I think there's a stage at which it can seem like, okay, that's in this transcendental realm and everything else is separate from that. And there's perhaps a later stage at which the field becomes all, all subsuming. Right. Irene sent over a question. Unfortunately, she's left the room, but I'm going to ask her a question. <laughs> um, we were talking about, based on that Prakash guy, um, we were talking about forcing stages of consciousness and all. And Irene's question or comment is, the only forced awakening I can think of would be a moment of complete surrender to the divine. At a time of hitting rock bottom with no place else to go, a person will seemingly plead or try to force the divine. But it is really a complete lack of any force or total surrender. Does that make sense? It does make sense. That often happens. I mean, you know, alcoholics talk about hitting rock bottom before they have a turnaround. And uh, right. many, and Adya sort of hit rock bottom, you know, bef- bef- when he left that retreat and thought he was going to crack up and then finally surrendered. I, I think a lot of times we we push it as far as we can, think, you know, in terms of thinking we can do it. <laughs> and exactly, then, and exactly. Say, I give up. I can't do it. You know? <laughs> and then it, when, when you give up, it... it releases and that opens the space at least that's the way i interpret it yeah yeah when you give up it opens the space up for the real divine to come through yeah Yeah. which gets us back to the original topic of does one have to struggle a whole lot before giving up and realizing that the divine can do it for you or you know and there is that phrase god helps those who help themselves (laughs) <laughs> or can, can can one sort of who said that anyway? Ben Franklin. Or uh, it's in the Bible someplace, um, I oh. think. Or or else no, I don't think it is. Maybe not. It might have been Ben Franklin. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, someone will tell us. Or can one sort of bypass a lot of that struggle? And you know, it's like you know. Let's say you're on a train. Um, you can, can I just go ahead? Yes, please the go ahead. Question. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's karmic. I you, think for some go. people yeah. they they have to have that struggle. They can't let go without that struggle. And I mean, you've interviewed enough people. You probably know that there's a huge diversity of people in the ways they wake up. Some people could just be walking down the street. And suddenly <laughs> it's yeah. there, you know, it doesn't happen that often because but we have our minds are so programmed that we tend to push it away when it gets close. But there are a few people for whom it's not been a struggle, you know, it's very true. So there's. So there's nothing that says it has to be. It's just usually the mind is so programmed and it gets back to kind of what we were talking about in the beginning, that um, the way that memories are formed and the ways that we're taught to interpret experience, those all go against awakening. Yeah. And so you have to have, because of that, you usually have to be pushed. But I don't think there's anything inevitable about it. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, that's all right. I'm kind of reminded at this point of professional athletes who work really hard to become the best, you know. But then when you see them play, 
there's this naturalness and this eff- almost, it seems like effortlessness, even though they're working really hard, you know, playing tennis or basketball or whatever they're doing, but there's this grace. And that's one reason we like watching them is there's this sort of beauty of the, of the naturalness of their performance. But boy, a lot of work went into getting the, to that point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't think, it, I don't think awakening is that much analogous. No, not it, it's, it's because... a loose analogy. Because yeah, because it does rely on uh, memory, although it's muscle memory to a large extent. If you're talking about sports, but it's still memory. It's still learning, and you learn and you learn and you learn and you put that in the bank until you can draw it out naturally. And awakening doesn't work that way. And 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 again, I, I guess I still want to emphasize this because it's been such a hard learning for me that. It doesn't work that way with awakening. You can't learn how to do it. <laughs> True. Although ironically, at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna says to Lord Krishna, he says, my memory has been restored. I know who I am. Um, it's, oh, it, but that's a different memory. It's a different kind of memory. And a lot of people, all say, you've probably heard this, a lot of people say, you know, I've always known this. Somehow I just, it's so obvious now, but it, it always... It, you know, I never noticed it, but here it is. Boy, it's plain as the nose on my face. Right, right, right. A question came in from Vic, from Tim in Victoria, British Columbia. Um, he said, in my experience, the desire for and pursuit of fundamental truth seems to exaggerate attention or division. This is kind of what we've been talking about. Exaggerate attention or division between the focus and intimacy of the immediate human experience centered in the mind-body memory, well, this is perfect, and the sense of vastness and utter transcendence evoked by direct unbounded awareness. It is my intuition that these domains are not truly separate, yet this painful discontinuity persists. Can you express how true awakening reconciles this paradox? I love that question. It's really written. deep. Yeah, it's nice. Could you written. could you read it once again? I There's will. a the lot in there. The question is worth re- rereading. Um, so Tim from Victoria says, in my experience, the desire for and pursuit of fundamental truth seems to exaggerate. So in other words, the yearning, the striving seems yeah, to exaggerate a tension or division between the focus and intimacy of the immediate human experience centered in the mind body memory and the sense of vastness and utter transcendence evoked by direct unbounded awareness. It is my intuition that these domains are not truly separate, yet this painful discontinuity persists. Can you express how true awakening reconciles this paradox? You know, I would go into that place more deeply where he says, it's my intuition that this doesn't really exist mm. because there's a place where he knows that already. Yeah. And, um, and of course that's right. It doesn't truly exist. There's nothing there preventing awakening. And as I said, for me with Adya, that was what I heard. And, you know, you don't have to do anything and that don't have to do anything was a deep relaxation you know so that that tendency if i'm reading is if i'm getting his question right that tendency to to contract it's a kind of contraction to um that relaxes when that's actually heard you don't have to do anything it's already there and he already knows it's there he already knows it so um but it relaxes on its own t- in in its own time is my experience. You know, you can't say, "Relax now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm really gonna relax. <laughs> yes, it's like having a choppy pail of uh, having a pail of water that has little ripples on it, and you want the waves to stop, so you start trying to push them down. Yeah. You only you create also, more waves. Oh, wait, I have something else I want to say about that. Uh-huh. That that pushing toward is not really in the way it just seems to be in the way it's not really in the way so yeah you know if you get on a train uh you might be tempted to keep holding your suitcases uh but the train is actually carrying them for you you know you you can can put them down (laughs) 
<laughs> nice analogy. <laughs> Uh, did you make up that? Did you make that up? That's very good. No, I've thought of that one before. Actually, actually I think it might have been Amma that said that one. I don't know. I've heard it. Um, again, that phrase, be easy to us with gentle effort. Papaji used to say, give up the search. And a lot of people parroted that. And a lot of people sort of interpreted that to mean like, oh, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm enlightened. I don't need to do anything. I, mm. I think there's a sort of a balance between, um, you know, intentionality or motivation or um you know to grow spiritually and um getting in the way by injecting too much individual effort into the process you can actually throw a monkey wrench in the works if you (laughs) get too involved and i think that give up the search is uh, something i don't know the context in which papaji said it but it's uh, something that would be said at a specific time for a specific student. Right. It's the people not an sitting overall within generic... 20 feet of him in that room, you know, he, he was saying that to them then. Uh-huh. Because like, I would think it would even be more specific than that to the specific person who it's time. It's time for you to give up the search. Yeah. yeah. Because if you say it to anybody who hasn't barely started the search, they're not right. going to get anywhere. You know, That's important. Yeah. Yeah. So, Tim, uh, if we didn't fully answer your question, feel free to ask a follow-up. Um, yes, please. Yeah, because that was a really good question. Here's one that just came in from uh, some initials BB. Isn't that the name of that little robot in Star Wars, the, the little round <laughs> one that rolls along? <laughs> <laughs> BB something. Uh, BB from Vermont. Um, please speak of free will and choice. Or is there, is there only ever a continuing unfolding where one is not choosing their actions? This is an eternal debate. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I know that for some people this is a really important question. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you look at the, the structure of the universe as I understand it at this point, there can't really be individual free will because there's no individuals. Mm-hmm. So what is that what is that will then? On the other hand, there seems to there seems to be just as you would say there's nobody making lunch because there's nobody there, but nevertheless, You're I'm gonna be lunch. hungry after this interview. I'm gonna have to yeah. go get some lunch. Um, so operationally there's free will, but in terms of this structure of the universe there can't be there can't be it doesn't make any sense if there are no individuals there can't be individual free will so that's as best as i can do with that yeah i think it's like the pots you know there are no pots it's only clay and yet there's pots uh you know on one level there are no individuals on another level there are and uh the 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 bigger reality is that these paradoxes can be comfortably um contained within uh-huh. within within that bigger reality. Well, name tell what were the three things that he posited at the very end of that question again? Ooh, I just she? deleted it. Um, um oh. well well hang on, I'm gonna get it back. I it's not know, important. I just thought that's okay. I'll just get it. I'm here. not sure I answered the question thoroughly. Yeah. Here it is. Um please speak of free will and choice. Or is there only ever a continuing unfolding where one is not choosing their actions? Okay. Um, you know, I, 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 my hit on it is that the latter is the truth of it. But it seems that we are making choices in our everyday life. Certainly, when you're in, when you're in ordinary consciousness in the psychological realm deciding you know, do I want to go to a movie or do I want to stay home tonight? Um, I think the more important thing is what's underlying the question. Yeah, maybe BB can tell us what's underlying the question for him or her. Um, mm-hmm. I also think one has to be true to one's own experience. You know, someone says, you know, I I don't have a sense of a personal self. I don't feel like it. You know, there's no I making choices here. Everything seems to be on automatic. Fine, that's their experience, but is it your experience? And right. can, you, can you really live the experience uh, that another is describing if it's not actually your own? 
that is so important, and I think it's worth talking more about. That whole question of wanting to have to do the right thing in order to make progress. I have seen that. I mean, I was I was around Ajis Sangha for most of a decade. And I saw that the people who made progress were the people who always went inside instead of comparing themselves to what other people were doing. And it's really hard not to do. It's so hard not to do. You see somebody who seems to be awake and you're like, okay, tell me how you did that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, yeah. But it's really important not to compare and not to say, and I still have this tendency to do it sometimes, you know, I see somebody says, oh, I've experienced so-and-so, and I'm like, oh, I haven't, what's wrong with me? Wait a minute, <laughs> you know, yeah. but it, it's, it's so important to stay true to your own experience and not look at what other people are doing or how they did it, you know. Yeah, very true. It, it was even worse in the TM movement. I, I started a six-month course one time, and, and Marishi said to us, okay, this is a competition to see who can purify the fastest. And he had Are us, you kidding me? No, oh, and, and he had us fasting and doing all this stuff. And I, I naturally, being the fanatic that I am, went totally overboard and you know got down to 120 pounds and you know, was doing oh. all this weird stuff. And, and, then, and then later on, he actually grouped everybody into A, B, and C groups. Like A was sort of a nil group, and C, B was sort of people with sort of good experiences and the a and the a group was like people with really good clear experiences so there's this huge sense of like oh my god i want to be like them and all this stuff it was maybe it was to burn us out from that way of thinking i don't know but i don't think that way anymore (laughs) yeah that's horrid it's it's a good um principle not to compare oneself to others and and i think that something came up a little bit earlier that you hinted about or maybe said explicitly is um, that there is something inside, especially after the first awakening, that knows where you're going. And, and it's really, really important to trust that. You know? It's also important, I think, to, um, you know, these days, there's so much information coming at you. You know, there, there's so many things you can watch on YouTube in the spiritual realm and then you know political realm and all these you know the, the whole thing with covid-19 and all these different conspiracy theories flying around and you can you can spend all day watching that stuff and get you know rather influenced by it if you, especially if you're rather susceptible to being influenced by things and uh you can kind of get off in these tangents of you know, thinking about stuff w- without really discerning or discriminating clearly as to what might actually be true. And, you know, it becomes an addiction for some people. And I, I see a lot of spiritual people doing that. And in fact, I see some people saying, oh, how can spiritual people be so gullible as not to believe that this is a giant, you know, plot by Bill Gates to overtake the world? <laughs> and, and, you know, and on the other hand, I'm thinking, oh, how can spiritual people be so gullible as to believe that it is a giant plot by Bill Gates? So, I don't know, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, we're friends on Facebook, so we probably see some of the same stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whatever it is, I think it's important that one cultured discernment and discrimination on the, on the spiritual path. You remember that book, The Razor's Edge by W. Somerset Maugham? Mm-hmm. I don't, I, I probably read it, but probably too long ago to be able to tell you anymore. Famous book. I think it was based on his experience around Ramana Maharshi, but the, the implication of the title is that the spiritual path is a bit of a razor's edge and one can sort of easily go off one way or the other. And it's important to sort of be on your toes and be discerning and discriminating and cult- Especially in yeah. the beginning. Yeah. I, I think at any know, stage. what we're talking about. Really, no, I don't think so. Yeah. I think once you're I think once you really have established, at least in my experience, once you've really established that place in yourself, you really recognize it, then it doesn't, you don't get pulled anymore. Maybe. That's not your experience? No. I I see people who've been meditating for decades or on the spiritual path for decades who were kind of off in la la land with with in my opinion, with some of these ideas. And and we were talking earlier about spiritual teachers who get a little bit carried away with themselves, you know, because they begin to be adulated by their students. And Mm -hmm. uh, they might have been, you know, they might be old, they're they're old timers. So I I think no matter what stage you're at, um, I remember in Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi, when he met his teacher, Sri Yukteswar, 
Yukteswar said to him, he said, if at any point I seem to be falling from my status of, you know, God consciousness or my realization, he said, you know, help me, give me feedback. Um, don't, you know, don't, he, so he was saying right from the outset of his oh, relationship with Yogananda that I'm not, impact, I'm not infallible either. And, and yeah, no matter how advanced wonderful. you may be, yeah. you have to sort of be careful. Yeah, yeah. Well, infallible is, not being infallible is different though, isn't it? Than falling for kooky things. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe it's a matter of degree. Uh-huh. There's a quote from Padmasambhava, which I've said many times on this show, which is that he said, he was a great Buddhist teacher, but he said, uh, although my awareness is as vast as the sky, my attention to karma is as fine as a grain of barley flour. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> well, it means, you know, well, uh, another quote from Don Juan of the Carlos Castaneda books. He said, a warrior has time only for his impeccability. In other words, sort of, not being sloppy, being precise in, in one's behavior, in one's thought, in one's, you know, in, in life in general. Not too much work. Too yeah, much work. well. So what you're what you're getting I'm at? A la- <laughs> I'm a lazy spiritual devotee. <laughs> what did you say? What well, so what you're saying then is, you know, one can spontaneously just sort of. No, I think there are dangers. Mm. I think there are dangers, um, but. But you don't want to be browbeating yourself all the time. Yeah. It seems to me that you just have to, once the awakening is there, you know what's true. You know what's true. Mm-hmm. And so it's just a matter of turning to that. Don't forget to go there. Mm-hmm. You know, don't forget to go there. And it seems to me that's the simplest answer I could give to that, you know. Okay. Well, once the awakening is there, is it something you have to go to, or does it become an abiding sort of foundation? Eventually, Eventually. but not in the beginning. Okay. And not in the beginning. So you, in the beginning, you have to remind yourself to go there. Yeah. You know? And, and then eventually it abides. Eventually, it depends what you mean by abides. Um, <laughs> I know it's always there. From your experience. Let's, let's speak in terms of... In my experience, you. but, uh, you know, I will forget it when I'm having an ordinary conversation or, you know, whatever... Um, it's always it's always there. I can always find it, but I'm not always attending to it. Let's put it like yeah. that. And you shouldn't need to, um, should you? Oh, I don't think you need to. You don't need to yeah. attend to breathing. It just keeps happening. Even exactly. If you're, yeah. Exactly. I guess that we were talking a little bit about the spontaneity of of right action, and and you know there are examples of you know fairly advanced teachers who have gotten into trouble um, be, because perhaps they don't have enough critical feedback from students. Perhaps they they refuse to you know, accept critical feedback and they kind of get carried away in their own grandiosity. And, and, you know, these could be fairly, fairly advanced people with, you know, multiple levels of awakening. So I I don't know. It's a fatal flaw. Yeah. It's a fatal flaw. And it's, I don't know. Um, Obviously there's some ego stuff that hasn't been taken care of, you know, and that can exist side by side with awakening. So, but I don't have an answer to that, you know. I, I, I see it and I'm appalled by it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um and 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 it's also hard to discern, like we'll take somebody dead so we don't get in any trouble. Uh <laughs> uh Trungpa, Oh you know, yeah. was he Jeez. a genuine teacher or was he did he have ego stuff? I think he was a genuine teacher, but I know there are people who say genuine teachers wouldn't do this and that and the other thing, you know. Um I think it depends on where it's coming from. Yeah. You know? Well, in case people don't know, he died in his 40s of alcoholism with his body completely destroyed, uh, you know, Uh, in a a state of delirium. Um, So you can, uh, we have to sort of define what genuine teacher means, I think. And a lot of people benefited from their association with him, you know? Um, A lot of people. Pema Chodron and, and many others. Same with Adi Da, who was another one. Um, you know, I've been interviewed a number of people who were his students. And so, you know, my way of reconciling the paradox is just to think of everyone as a work in progress. And someone can have great, you know, spiritual gifts and still have, like you said, um, 
all kinds of shadows or unresolved issues. Ken Wilber uses the phrases, wake up, clean up, and grow up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like you need all three. This, yeah, and is there a connection? I mean, I think that's part of idealizing a teacher, that we expect that the teacher has a completely either totally transparent ego or no ego at all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that projection onto the teacher of no ego is a problem. Um, and does the ego ever really go anywhere or does it just, I mean, I don't have an answer to that. I know I still have an ego. I have a pretty big one as my friends will tell me. Um, but so do I, as know, my wife will tell me. <laughs> <laughs> or does it just become less important because it, you know it's not who you are? You know it's not who you are, so there's not as, as much investment in it. Um, or maybe for some people it totally disappears. I actually does. I just don't know. I want to try to stay with my experience and not, you know, compare myself with people out there who claim not to have one. Yeah, that's always good to do. Um, you know how you were saying earlier about being a little bit more self-referral in terms of not investing all your hopes and dreams and beliefs and everything in a teacher, but sort of looking, you know, checking in with what you think and what you know and stuff like that, not being dependent, you know, that stuff you were saying. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, with regard to these teachers like Trungpa or others who are you know, I mean, the scene around him was everybody was having a drunken orgy because that was his. <laughs> that's what he did. Yes, yeah, because he must did. Be, it must be the way to get enlightened. <laughs> All right, same with Adi Da. Now, you know, it seems to me one could say, well, you know, I mean, see, what, what often happens is people say something like, well, this doesn't make any sense to me. This seems really crazy, but this guy's supposed to be enlightened and I'm not. So what do I know? So whoop de doo let's pop a cork and, you know, get into it. Um, whereas I think the more healthy approach would be to say, well, you know, there's something wrong here. And um, I don't, if this is enlightenment, maybe I don't aspire to th this kind of enlightenment. And maybe I'll just go, you know, hop in the car and find something. Well, Wait, I think it's a little more complicated it than probably that. Is. Because, because the people who've met Trungpa, and you interviewed them, I'm sure, although I don't think I've watched those interviews, but they, they were impressed. They more than impressed. Mm -hmm. More than impressed. You know, it's the same as when I, I didn't, uh, it's the same as when I met Adya. You recognize. Yeah. You recognize there's someone who's awake. And so that, is the confusion because you recognize the awakeness, but you see the behavior. Yeah. And so what do you do? Is that, is the behavior, you know, contradictory or is it just behavior? I mean, he, the way he described it, as I understand it is it's just my behavior. It doesn't matter. You know, it's just my karma. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard about the Association for Spiritual Integrity. It's a it's an organization that I founded with along with Jack O'Keefe and Craig Holiday and uh, mm -hmm. Mariana Kaplan and um, oh, geez, her name is slipping my mind at the moment. I have heard it, and I, I don't know why. It might have been I went yeah. on your website and found it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In any case, uh, it's because of this issue, because it's been so rife in, in the spiritual community. And it's, it's done so much damage and disillusioned so many people and confused so many people. So we thought to just kind of um, establish some sort of code of ethics, you know, not, not that we're in a judgmental position, but just some kind of points which might reasonably ex be expected to, you know, be... Um, to align with spiritual teaching and, and spiritual studentship. Um, so people can go to that website if they want, spiritual-integrity.org. Um, but I don't know. I've thought about this a lot and given talks at Sand about it and stuff. And I, I just sort of feel like, again, work in progress. Everybody's a work in progress. Someone, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there have been some great scientific geniuses who were morally off the wall. Right, <laughs> uh, right, even right. Einstein yeah. was said to be sort of a bit of a, a womanizer. Um, so, and then this gets the whole question about morals being relative and who's to say what's right and wrong. It, get, it gets complicated. But I don't know, maybe I'm naive and idealistic, but I've always felt that that enlightenment 
should imply a, a blossoming of a holistic development. The kind of thing you see in someone like mm-hmm. Adya, who mm-hmm. just really seems to have his act together in, in so many different ways. Um, at, at least, you know, if there are different kinds of enlightenment, then that's the kind I want. <laughs> Yeah, well taken, yeah. <laughs> for sure. And I, I know I have talked to students who are very grateful for his, you know, straight arrow, if I could use that yeah. terminology, you know, that he doesn't he doesn't do messy stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And yeah. and he and, and some other teachers are, are very good about, you know, call me on my shit, you know, if I if I seem to be uh you know, they're they're not closed to any kind of constructive criticism or feedback. Right. Yeah. Right. They don't lord it over you and say you don't you're, you're too stupid to understand someone like me. <laughs> uh, yes, that can be a response. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a tricky response. <laughs> oh, there was a teacher whose interview I took down who slept with hundreds of his female students, and I when I took the interview down, he was very upset, and he said, "Who are you to judge what an awakened person is is supposed to be like?" You know. And, hundreds. Oh my goodness. Hundreds. Yeah. Busy guy. Yeah, he's he's got a lot of energy. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get ourselves off this topic. Um, okay. I, I have a, another a follow-up question came in from BB in Vermont. He said, my question on free will comes from hearing so many teachers speak about what needs to be done, etc. If you cannot choose, then you are a person who gets to do. Uh, there is no Probably doer. What you, you yeah. cannot do. Yeah, it's a little bit... Right. Watch the editing here, Dan. Uh, the, then there, so then there is no one who can choose to do whatever teachers say needs doing. Okay, so teachers are saying to do this and that and the other thing, but if there's no doer, how can you how can you choose to do it? I think that's what he's saying. Well, what comes to me, I don't know how good of an answer I can give to this, but what comes to me is someone asked Adya a question like that one time, and he said, "I'm just moving energy around." So. It's like there's a a myth that there's a human self in here and that it's doing what the teacher is saying to do and that there are two discrete entities. My hand just gets big when I do this, doesn't it, on the screen? (laughs) (laughs) Um, There are two discrete entities, the teacher and you, and the teacher is telling you, the self, with a small s, to do something. But really, it's just energy happening and so the teacher who's in that deep place and you know anybody who goes into that space with Adya at satsang can feel it immediately you know can move the energy in another apparent form and that's what's happening that seems the clearest explanation to me you know yeah i like that yeah you know the term catalyst a catalyst in a chemical Mm -hmm. reaction um facilitates the the chemical reaction without itself um changing or something i forget exactly how it works but it, it's sort of a it's you know when, when the catalyst is introduced then the reaction is facilitated so mm-hmm. the, you know, a, t- a spiritual teacher like audrey could be thought of as a catalyst perhaps who you know in, in it's not he that he is doing stuff to people uh, or even that they are doing stuff to themselves because of what he says but somehow he he sets up a helps to create a, a an energy field in which um, awakening and transformation is um, more more likely to to take place. Right. Yeah. And, and so there's a little bit of a, I guess, a, a philosophical contradiction because Adya is also not a separate person, uh-huh. um, and and yet. Most of it has. Most of us have experienced that field that surrounds people that are awake, and most of us, some of us, know how to generate it also. And so, um, so there is something that the form embodies, some kind of energy that the form embodies, and there is some way in which that energy is can be thrown out seems a kind of the wrong kind of word but i can't think of another one <laughs> yeah there's an entrainment that takes place entrainment what do you mean by entrainment well the way entrainment works is well let's let's think of tuning forks you know you have a tuning fork that is struck and another tuning fork nearby if it's the right 
t- frequency or, or note uh, uh, of a tuning fork begins yes. to re- begins to resonate also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or a yes. burning log. You know, you put another log near it, and that log starts to burn. So mm-hmm. um, it's not like something is there. There's like a well, it's like even in this is a weird example, but they say that in nunneries and so on. Um, all the women end up getting into uh, having their menstrual cycle. Uh, oh, yeah, I've heard that. Uh, yeah, yeah, at the same time. It's sort of there's this kind of entrainment that takes place. Mm-hmm. And we were talking an hour ago about the, the value of being in the company of, of spiritual aspirants, if you are one yourself. So there's something that there's kind of a mutually reinforcing influence right. that takes place when the field gets enlightened, enlivened and everyone within that field benefits mutually. Right, yeah. yeah. And yeah. a teacher can just be a some somewhat to someone that kickstarts the enlivenment or helps to um, accelerate mm-hmm. it more than it would if he weren't there. Yeah, I think that is what a teacher is. But it, for some of us who like to do a lot of projection, it takes a lot of time to to figure that out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's kind of cool. I mean, it, it it enables us to conclude that there is definitely a value to a teacher, but it's not just the teacher. That is, I mean, if that, that is doing it, it's it's more like a field effect, and the teacher is just a, a catalyst for en- helping to enliven that field effect. But if he were all by himself, I don't think the field would get enlivened in the same way. It, it takes the whole sangha, the whole confluence of, of people, to do it. Right, uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. So, Bill, I hope. Or BB, I wonder if I, I know a BB from Vermont, Bill Brunel. I wonder, oh. uh, probably not him. <laughs> but in, in any case, um, hopefully that we answered that question. And many more. <laughs> and many more, yeah. <clears throat> um, and I hope people don't mind that I'm talking so much in this interview. I get I get flack yeah, for that. You, some... you need to stop apologizing for that. You, what you say is perfectly interesting. <laughs> well, I get criticized pretty harshly sometimes mm-hmm. by people for, for doing it. And I try not to, but it's different in different interviews. I mean, we're having this conversation. And... Yeah. Well, you want to say you want, you want to say what comes up for you. Otherwise, it's not a natural interchange. You yeah. Know? I just don't want to mm-hmm. overshadow the, the guest and... You know, mm-hmm. it depends. Some guests, they, they go on and on and on. You, you're giving short answers, so I have to say something. <laughs> I do want to talk a little bit about the role of fiction, as I Oh, yeah, mentioned. let's do it. Yeah, because I think that's something different that other people are not, you know, most most spiritual people don't read fiction. Um, they think it's not true, and I'm, in, I'm into truth. <laughs> uh-huh. So why would I read fiction? And um, I, I sort of look at it, Hello, you broke up a little bit. Oh, I'm here. Okay, here. It's okay. Okay. Um, I sort of look at it a different way. I, I think that because the ultimate reality is beyond appearances, you really can't define truth. And so fiction is actually a better means of uh, understanding ultimate reality. Mm-hmm. And it, it doesn't have to be, I mean, in my novel, there's a character who's trying to get enlightened, but it doesn't have to be that direct. It can just be um, that fiction points you to that deeper truth that can't be said in words. And I mean, sometimes I read a passage and I'm like, how did he do that? How did he get so perfectly what reality is? Not by saying it in we're in, in definitions, but somehow creating you talked about field i think you can create a field with words also so um i'm putting out a pitch there for not only my novel but for (laughs) for fiction in general i think it's important to um to sort of expand the way we look at what we read and um and see that there's a way that language can um can work it's only it's almost the same way that Aja uses language as a satsang. You know, he talks around truth. He doesn't say truth because you can't say truth. Yeah. You know? And so I think I think literature does the same thing. It points us in that direction without defining it. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of great works of fiction that have been very spiritual. Siddhartha had a big effect on me when I first read it, Herman Hesse. Yeah, me too. I think my my novel is a spiritual contemporary female 
uh, version of Siddhartha and much longer. Yeah. But <laughs> and then I went back and read all. Let's let's just for a minute. Let's just mention some of our favorite spiritual fiction books, and maybe the audience will want to read some of those. What's another one of yours? Oh, um, go ahead if you have some. Yeah, I'll I think do of have some. Um, well, obviously, there's some. Well, well, firstly, the works of Lawrence Vanderpost. Uh, there's a book called um, oh, yeah. A Story Like fiction. the Wind and a Far Off Place. Um, oh, you wrote fiction too? Oh, yeah. Those, I didn't know those that. Those two books, oh. are they're, they're his best. I read all his books, but those two are just oh. absolutely beautiful. Um, they're set in, in South Africa, and it's about the friendship between a, 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 a you know, South oh. African boy and a, a Bushman. And I remember that. Those are his pre-Zen, because you know he did Zen in Japan. I knew he went that, to the East. I didn't know he actually That's why I yeah. read him. I read his, his, his memoir of doing Zen in Japan. And I, don't, I did know at the time that he was a novelist, but I forgot about that part of it. Yeah. yeah. And actually, as we're talking here, if people want to send in a little question about, you know, through the question form, their favorite works of spiritual fiction, we'll mention them. But another would be, um, well, some of the great movies. I mean, Star Wars is a very spiritual thing, inspired a lot by the works of Joseph Campbell. Um, and, uh, you know, cl Close Encounters, I think, is a tremendous allegory for the spiritual path. You remember mm -hmm. that, how that movie went? Yeah, I did see that one. I, I don't know if I remember a yeah, lot of it. Richard but. Dreyfuss, he was zapped, and he had this experience, and he couldn't let it go. He, he knew there was something more. And the whole society was telling him, no, give it up, forget it, you're crazy. And, you know, he, he eventually got out to Wyoming, and he's going towards Devil's Tower, and the government had staged this great big thing. There's a poison gas leak, and you got to get out of here. It's going to kill you. And he said, oh, wow. no. I said, no, I have to go. I know there's something there. This means something. And finally prevailed, and he ended up being the only one to get on the spaceship because he, he was the only one that didn't get uh, waylaid by all the naysayers. Uh huh. No, I have to see that again. It's been, you know, many years. <laughs> yeah, fantastic movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I read a good one recently that'll be published pretty soon. Um, I forget the title of it. It'll, but uh, it was it was really cool. I, I shouldn't go into it, but it'll maybe I'll mention it on Batcap when it actually comes out. They they asked me to write a blurb for it, which I did. Ah. It was a first. It's a novel. Yeah, it's a novel. First spiritual oh, fiction great. book I've read in years, but it, it involves the Mayans and the Pleiades and all kinds of ah. cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I did reviews uh, for a a website that's coming back. It's uh, it's called the Buddhist Fiction Blog, ah. and um, so I'd, I'd like to know about that book when it comes out. I might maybe I'll review it. It it's. It's all kinds of different things. I mean, when you say Buddhist fiction, you can mean a lot of things. A lot of the books are just books that have a Buddhist setting. You know, it's not really about people on an enlightenment journey. Other ones are people on an enlightenment journey. Uh, other ones are, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole hodgepodge of different books. But uh, it's amazing how many there are, actually, <laughs> yeah. that uh, relate to Buddhism. You could probably think of a lot of the scriptures of different religions as fiction because, I mean, it's very unlikely oh. that many of the stories in these books are true. If, if you read the, the, um, the Puranas yeah. of the Vedic literature, there are all kinds of fantastical stories and events and people doing all these amazing things. And, and you know, it could have been embellished by some, someone with a bit of imagination, but, um, you know, but there's a tremendous wisdom you know, imparted by these books. And, sort of. More, more like mythical. Yeah, yeah, mythical. Yeah. And I think there was a time when there wasn't really that kind of differentiation between what was, what's true and what's not true that there is now. So, uh, you know, history was mythical. It wasn't, uh, you know, researchers going back to find out what really happened in the past. I never really read Philip K. Dick, but I'm told that he was a very spiritual uh -huh. guy, that his science fiction works were, were um, you know, really had a spiritual bent to them. Right, right. Yeah, I haven't I, I haven't ever gotten into science fiction, although some people keep sending me things and saying, this is really good, you gotta try it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. That book I was just trying to remember the title of that I read and wrote the blurb for it was originally called it was I think something like Awakening the Story of Adya. And I, I got back to the authors and I said, Adya, I said, this this sounds like it's a biography of Adya. 
And I checked with Adya. I said, are you okay with this? You want this book to go out with this title? I said, no, it's, people are going to think it's my biography. And yeah. so they changed the title. But they were students of Adya's. And so they, they were just kind of honoring him by you. And Adya was the name of the planet in the Pleiades where this guy was supposedly from. But they changed oh, it to something. Oh, was science fiction? <laughs> yeah, that they had they made up. But they changed it to a different name. <laughs> I can see why he wouldn't want that. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there's also, you know, it doesn't have to be about a spiritual journey to be spiritual. Good point. You know, Give us an I, example. It, um, there was a book I read, I think it was a couple of years ago, called Beautiful Ruins. And I can't remember the author. I could, unfortunately, I could get, you, get it to you later, but that doesn't do any good for this interview. Um, and it was about, it was a whole journey to place mostly in Italy, um, and the characters, it was one of these things where all the, the multiple characters and the story converges in the end. And I got to the last chapter and I thought, I don't want this to end. Should I even read this last chapter? And then I read the last chapter and it was so transcendent. There was something about it. And when, when this happens to me, I can't put my finger on what it is, no matter how many times I go back and read it, that does it. But it's something like, Life is perfect just as it is, no matter what you think. You know, when I read a book that has that essence in it, it seems like the writer has seen something that, you know, through all the things, this is, this is the appearance, and the appearance is perfect just as it is. You don't need to go rearranging the pieces. And I don't even understand how somebody can write like that, you know. That's that's great. And of course, then there's not only spiritual literature, but there's spiritual music. I mean, there's some, you, know, you listen to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or something and you get yourself in the right mood and it can just send you out into the stratosphere. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And all those things relate back somehow to what we fundamentally are. It's touching in, I think, to what we fundamentally are and the reason that it works is because we don't have words for it. We can't define it and put it in a pigeonhole. And yeah, that's puzzle. a beautiful point. You know, I think the perhaps the greatest works of art of any kind, music, art, any, literature, are they spring from that field which we fundamentally are. The, the artist is in tune with that field to a sufficient degree that the expression of the art uh, enlivens that field in us and b helps bring us back mm -hmm. to that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think the greatest art, that's what it does. It really yeah. does. Yeah, it, it sort of evokes the transcendent it, it, through a form. Mm -hmm. mm. Right, right, exactly. Mm. And it's, you know, it's interesting because when you see that everything is appearances, then it makes sense to read a novel where everything is made up. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> everything is appearances, and uh, it's just another version of that. Yeah, it's true. Well, there's so many things we could say about this, <clears throat> but um, anyway, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't think that topic has ever come up in a Bat Gap interview talking about art and uh, and literature and so on in the spiritual context, which is a huge area that I'm not really that qualified to to talk about, but um, I think is very real for millions of people and has been for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at, you know, the Pietà or something like that. It's just a bunch of marble, but it right. just has, it sort of embodies the, the transcendent. Uh-huh, right. All righty. Well, um, what else? Is there anything else that you, you'd like to cover that we have neglected to talk about? I'm sure there will be after we quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I always do that right after I hang up and think, oh, God, we should have talked about that, or I shouldn't have <laughs> done that, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anything. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. So yes. you have a blog, and I'll link to it. And there's lots and lots of entries in it, and people might enjoy reading it. And I guess it's interactive, right? If people want to leave comments or questions or whatever, they can do that. Yeah, I hope they do. And there's also a, there's also links within that blog too. I have a a literary blog too. Okay, great. It's focused on. Well, literature. I can link to both, so they don't have to hop from one to the other. Oh, okay. You can send me the links, and I'll just link to both. Okay, and then the the Buddhist fiction blog just came back online, so I'll I'll, yeah. I'll link to that too. Yeah, give me everything you want me to link to, and um, 
and that chapter of your book that I read was very enjoyable. I think the whole book is is going to be very interesting. You really um, want to read it? Yeah, well, really send it to me. It I'll, I'll give it a crack. You know, it's it's not a matter <laughs> okay. of want; it's a matter of finding the time. Um, right. Because right. I, you know, I'm in continuing continuing battle with my inbox. I never managed to empty it. Um, no, I, you're a busy person. I, yeah. I can see from what you have listed. And then I have tons yeah. of stuff to read and tons of stuff to listen to, but I like mm-hmm. it that way. It's, it's kind of like, you know, an idle mind is the devil's playground. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I didn't send it to you because I didn't want to, you know, people feel obligation when you send them something. And I didn't want you to feel like, oh, you know, no time to read this, but I got to read it. You no, know? no, that's nice so of you, but I read as much as I can. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I, you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So thanks. And um, so those who've been listening or watching, uh, there'll be a page for Chris on batgap.com, as there always is for each interview. And I'll, uh, I'll include the links that she's talking about. Um, you know, you might want to even do some, I don't know, so at some point, some interactive video thing where you can have a lot of people are doing that these days where they just have a, a zoom meeting and anybody wants to join in and talk like you could talk about spiritual literature or, or buddhist literature or whatever you've you know, and uh you don't even have to charge money for it people enjoy that kind of thing just a suggestion oh right. well, that's a good idea i mean i do do some zoom stuff with friends but it's, yeah it's people i know so at this point so yeah well you make some new ones new friends yeah yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, well, thanks, Chris, and thanks for your um, flexibility. We made Chris jump through some hoops in order to get the right level of video quality here. Um, but it I came- hope you did get it. Yeah, yeah, we did. It looks very good. And thanks, thanks to your friend Harry for letting you come to his place and uh, make this. Just rec- thank you to you. <laughs> and uh, so I'm glad we had this chance to meet. And hope to meet you in person one of these days. Thank you very much. Oh, you're Appreciated welcome. Appreciated your attention and your good questions. Thanks. And, and thanks to those who have been listening or watching. And next week, I'll be speaking with Elena Nazinski, who also lives in the Santa Cruz area, and um, who was one of the founders of Liberation Unleashed. But she hasn't been doing that for a number of years. But she wrote a book called Buddha on a Bull, um, I guess, which is reminiscent of the, the, the Zen ox herding pictures or something. Yes. <laughs> But in any case, she'll be my guest next week. So um, thanks for listening and watching, and we'll see you for the next one. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Thank you.